So, fellas, in case you guys haven't seen or heard or noticed or tuned into pop culture, it seems as though a certain media franchise is having a bit of a renaissance. Did you know there is a brand new Ninja Turtles movie? It's true. It's called Mutant Mayhem, and it's apparently not doing so great. <laughs> Ninja Turtles are kind of taking over, and it's not just film. Because there's also these new skins in Street Fighter! Yo! They're only for your made-up character, and they each cost $15. It's the price of a full game for four of these. What were they thinking, dude? Oh my god. Only 15? 15 each! But the Ninja Turtles are back in a big way. But where the hell did they come from? And my question is, how did this violent indie comic become a 15 billion dollar franchise? Matt has the answer. Why the hell is this so popular and why are they everywhere? Man, why? They were in Smite? You're kidding. <laughs> Who are they? Are they gods? I get if if I was in ancient Egypt and I saw that I would think it was a god. I'd be like, damn, that shit Horus. They skateboard. Why have they made fifteen billion dollars? Let's find that. Matt, take it away. Shall we? You see a lot of familiar names that were developed by big companies, but down here at number twenty, you'll see a fifteen billion dollar above property Toy that Story. That can't still be true. What? They literally sat down in their living room, drew it, lettered it, and with a thousand dollar loan from one of their uncles, started their own business to print and sell it. So how did this tiny, violent, black and white comic end up becoming a property <laughs> bigger than the Avengers? They look so... Violent, black and white com Small. It's a parody? Well, like, the, the, the series is always a joke, right? They're always supposed to be ridiculous. Pro parody of Daredevil? Really? The story I found was a lot more interesting and ultimately, like so many stories of rapid success, sadder than I could have expected. Oh. So let's head back to 1981, before the toys, the movies, the TV shows, to a 19-year-old Kevin Eastman, a guy who desperately <laughs> wants so to be a comic silly. artist, but is currently stuck boiling lobsters at a restaurant in Maine. <laughs> okay. Yeah, hey, this is a great presentation. I don't, this is a little intense. This shot is a little intense. I gotta be honest with you. This is a little strong. In his free time, Eastman devours all types of comics. He especially loves the king himself, Jack Kirby. But he reads everything from superhero comics to the edgy European import heavy metal, which will come... Is heavy metal, like, popular? I only know it because it's the show with... The, it had the movie with the boobs back to later. Now, it in like his a quest deal? to find all the most interesting comics, he comes across a Very local self-published okay. comic magazine called Scat. He likes what he sees, so he writes a letter to the guys making it and ends up getting connected with one of Scat's main artists, Peter Laird. Now, Laird is eight years older than Eastman, but despite the difference in age, the two become fast friends, bonding over their love of comics and bad TV, and because Laird, too, dreams of becoming a comic book artist and drawing comics in front of the TV. Well, on one of those fateful comic drawing nights, Eastman whips up a sketch to try and make Laird laugh. It's a turtle with nunchucks. Yo! Ew. I never realized how important it is that they have human hands. I forgot turtles got hands like that. How would his ass nunchuck? He just rested them on it. He could not hold them. Laird grabs a piece of paper and does his own rendition. <laughs> a little better. Those look like rockets. That one's pretty good, actually. I like that one. Eastman gives the drawing a name. Ninja Turtle. Let's Laird go. fires back, adding Teenage Mutant. That I think we find our first clue as to why they would become so wildly successful. The idea wasn't created by some toy executive or marketing guru. It wasn't even created by a work for hire comic artist trying to meet a deadline. It was made by two friends who were just trying to make each other laugh. I do feel like there's like, th the secret sauce in Ninja Turtles is the fact that it's so long. Like the clue is that this shit is supposed to be stupid and goofy. Because, like, if it was trying to be cool, it would just be, like... It, they wouldn't be turtles. But th the fact that it's so long is is very funny. Because it is not supposed... It's not quippy, right? Of course, at this point, they have no <laughs> idea where they... I feel like I'm playing Five Nights, and I keep putting down the camera to make sure he's not, like, jumping at the screen. Turn that sketch into a full comic. They multiply their little turtle by four. Give I don't... I know turtles have tails, but I don't like that. I... I don't think they should have tails anymore. And base their personalities on themselves and their friends. Oh, Donatello is Laird, the reserve tech shooting. geek. And Eastman is Raphael, the wild hothead. And this, for me, is where we see the second key to TMNT's success. It's such an odd choice to use now I hate the tails. Yeah. your main character <laughs> designed four times. But I'm glad they got this is rid a story of it. about friendship. Ew! 
comic with things they love. One of the things they love is Daredevil. So the turtle's origin story actually happens just out of frame of Daredevil's origin story, where the goo that gave Matt Murdock his powers drips on a few turtles. And it doesn't stop Wait, there. Daredevil got powers from goo? I didn't know that. I thought he was just like super blind. Super blind, the fuck is that? If you, okay, you're just, you were blind from birth, but you were just naturally adept. Like, very good at martial art, whatever the fuck. I thought that was his thing. Daredevil's master is Stick, so of course the turtles study under Splinter. Daredevil fights the hand, so turtle fights the, the foot. Feet. People have called yep. it a parody, but I don't think that's really an accurate description. It's more just a goofy celebration of the things they love, including Jack Kirby, to whom the structure of the book owes a lot of credit. Instead of having one write, the other draw, or one pencil and the other ink, they both sit down next to each other and pass every page back and forth, each doing a little bit of the penciling, ink, and shading so that you can't see who did what on any particular page. Oh, dude, that's cool good for them bros for life man that's awesome i like that that's insane it's not how comics are supposed to work but for these two guys oh man does it work stop showing that the turtles splinter the ooze sewers the shredder the foot clan it's got show me krang bro i like krang the raw exuberance of two guys who are just trying to amuse themselves and each other and with a loan from eastman's uncle they print 3,000 copies of their comic they name their publishing company Mirage Studios because it's not really a studio at all, just two guys in their living room. Wait, they're Mirage? I didn't know that. Holy shit. Krang was actually in the original comic as the big bad. I think one of my favorite things about Ninja Turtles is like, villain list goes deep, but you don't have to care about it if you don't want to. I think Ninja Turtles are fascinating at a conceptual level, but I feel like a man-child if I got into them, so I stay away. Don't want to get too into it because I am too old. <laughs> to love things earnestly. I have to either do it ironically or from a, a distance away. I would completely agree with you if you didn't play Mario for a living. Well, that's the thing. I'm trying not to go full saturation. I read one issue of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Next thing I know, I got Funko Pops all over the wall and a tattoo of, of Luigi for years to come. <laughs> Eastman goes back to his summer job in Portland cooking lobsters, and Laird's wife gets a job in Connecticut, so he moves away. The roommates split up and go their separate ways. All 3,000 <laughs> issues of TMNT number one sell out. So they do Jeez. a second print run of 6,000 more, and then all of those sell out. They've made enough money to pay Eastman's uncle back and even have a bit left over. 15,000 copies in the first print run. Damn. Then they reprint issue one and sell 30,000 more copies. Something's happening. They quit their jobs. Eastman moves to Connecticut to work on issue three, which launches with a print run of 50,000 copies. Three issues in, and they've achieved their dream. In that little ass house, look at that shit. I know it smelled crazy in there. It smelled like old and paper. No, I, I th it seemed like it smelled like a cat in there. I bet they got a cat. But before we move on, let's take a look at these comics. Because okay. there's so much talk about how successful in business Eastman and Laird became that there can be this false narrative that these guys were just really lucky or at best were really good character designers. There's no Holy. editor, no boss telling them what they could or couldn't do. So they just decide to do whatever they want. Like in issue three, they set out to do the longest car chase in comic history. And they do. And it works because the staging, the geography, the pacing of it, all of it's absolutely masterful. This seems pretty good. The sense of motion here is pretty good. But there's a fluidity to the storytelling that really sets it apart from everything else coming out in the 80s in the West. How did a Triceratops get invented? How did that happen? They're aliens? They're called the Triceratons. That fucking rules. Issue 2 introduces April O'Neil, Baxter Stockman, and in the fourth issue they create Casey Jones. I still don't know what this guy's deal is, but I would have liked a costume of him actually in Street Fighter. I pay $15 for that. By issue five, the turtles are in space, meaning aliens and robots. There's this pure raw joy of being able to make a living drawing comics with your buddy that just spills out onto- They're all bat chesting. <laughs> Look at all the soy faces. Eastman and Larry get approached by a bunch of licensing agents who promise big TV shows and toy deals, w. but they want exclusivity and these long five-year contracts. But Eastman and Larry are savvy. They know better than to give away control of their creation. And as we'll soon see, that will be both a good thing me. and a bad thing for them. But when licensing agent Mark Friedman shows up and offers them a 30-day, non-exclusive deal to prove what he can do, they decide to let him take a shot. Damn, and I want to recognize 30 day? And in the 30 days he was given, he gets a deal with Playmates. Playmates was a doll manufacturer, but wanted to challenge Hasbro and Mattel in the action figure space, so they were an underdog in their own way too. Well, with the toy deal in place, they hire an agency to produce a five-episode TV cartoon. Damn, dude, it's so cool! 
It never looked like this, though. Like, in the actual thing, they're always just goofy and making stupid, shitty puns. And Mikey's like, pizza! They let them sand the rough edges off their creation, adding colored bandanas and pizza, removing the violence, the grittiness, and the kind of phallic-looking tails. You too, huh? Huh, Matt? You too? Now, Laird had an especially hard time with this, but he went along with what... <laughs> I'm not getting rid of the dicks! Okay, I guess. If it gets us a toy deal, I suppose. These older, wiser executives were telling him. And at the end of the day, he's been... <laughs> wiser executives? Listen, I can, get, I can make you both millionaires. But I've been in this business for 20 years, and I gotta tell you, you gotta get rid of those turtle dicks. Wise decision. Mm. They'd always have their black and white comic where they could tell their version of the turtles. Sadly, those would turn out to be the famous last words, but we'll get to that. First, turtle mania. Turtle mania! Let's go! In case you weren't alive in the late 80s, the show and figures turned out to be a huge success. To the point where, so I was, you know, I was young in the early 90s, mid 90s, and, uh, my mom still gets me Ninja Turtles stuff. Maybe that's why I don't want to get into it, because I want to be like, Mom, relax. <laughs> you know what I mean? I think we have to remember the landscape at the time. Turtles are situated between the cornball <laughs> 80s-ness of He-Man and Thundercats, but before the badassness of 90s animation and the anime invasion. X-Men always seem very interesting to me, too. I love that they just introduce new characters. It's just like, yeah, I do fireworks. Damn, cool. I wonder what happens there. And she's like, yep. I do fireworks, and I'm going to kill that guy. Cool. Goodbye. And then they never come back. <laughs> Iceman, who shows up and uh, freeze. This looks like a job for Iceman. And then he's done. That's it. One time. That's kind of cool. The money was flowing in. Mirage was growing. <laughs> Kevin Eastman bought a tank, and the licensing deals kept coming. For what? But before we move on, I want to look at one of the comics they published during this period. Bro, this guy is AI. Watch his eye here. Do you see that? He's a fucking replicant. Listen, hey, if you're watching this, please don't copyright strike me. This is a great video, and I appreciate that you put it up. The turtle's downstairs neighbor is none other than Jack Kirby. But this Jack Kirby has a magical gem, which, when attached to his drawing pencil, brings anything that he draws into the real world. <laughs> Another bad chest. The turtles with teeth are freaking me out. And that must have been exactly how Eastman and Laird felt at that moment. Watch. <laughs> the turtles with the fucking... <laughs> it's killing me, all these faces. Watching the little drawings from their living room come to life and take over every corner of pop culture. But that comic doesn't exactly have a happy ending. You see Kirby, along with Donatello, go through a portal to a world populated entirely by his drawings. Donatello escapes. Kirby is trapped forever in the world of his drawings. Before the portal closes, he sends Donatello a note. On it is a drawing of a turtle and a quote from one of Jack Kirby's comics. Life, at best, is bittersweet. You see, despite all the success, their relationship was falling apart. They were spending so much time managing the business that they barely had any time to work on the comic book. And when they Aww. did, they'd spent so much time apart that they were creatively on totally different pages. And by issue 10, their relationship had gotten so yeah. distant and fractured that they're going back and forth, whiting out each other's drawings and drawing over them. Dude, that's sad. That's so sad. You lost something really special. You lost the magic of it in chasing... You know, financial stability, your your millionaire dreams, which is nice to have, and you know, but you had something really special with that, and it could have gone for oh, that's sad. And as you read these issues, you can almost feel them trying to heal their broken relationship. They moved the turtles out of New York City to Northampton, Massachusetts, where they live. <laughs> the turtles are broken and defeated, not on speaking terms with. Where are they going to Massachusetts? You can feel the melancholy, and you have to wonder which of them wrote this journal entry for April. I also have friends, real friends that I care for and that care for me. I'll always be there for them and they for me. This will probably be my last entry. I guess I just wanted some kind of final word, sort of wrap up all that I had written so far. Last issue they worked on together as true collaborators. Their entire creative partnership had lasted for only 15 issues. Damn, dude. That sucks. And the quality of the comic does suffer pretty dramatically as they start trading off. They're not bad comics per se, but there's something that feels forced and just off about the whole thing. If they're that 
If it's that short, I'm going to read the old comics. I didn't realize it was that short. I can read 15 issues. What the fuck? They do come together for a three issue run that brings the Turtles back to New York, not jamming like they used to, but at least they were both involved and some of the spark comes back to the comic. But after that, they both step away from the comic completely, allowing the other members of the Mirage studio to run the comic while they focus on the business. Mirage publishes a ton of comics in this period, but neither Eastman or Laird have significant involvement. They plan out a 12 issue arc, but they only make it one issue working together as collaborators before Eastman leaves again and Laird finishes the series with other artists after that run who was that collaborators before eastman leaves again and laird finishes the who the fuck is that is that a turtle who the fuck is that turtle mania is dying down oh turtle the third mania movie is a over. critical failure and plans for a fourth movie are scrapped oh the cartoon man. show is canceled and playmates winds down its toys the show comes out with a fifth turtle but it was the final straw in their friendship and their partnership and the show i forgot there's a fifth turtle wasn't it a girl the show comes out with a fifth turtle why did they ki oh i thought they were kissing and the show is a commercial failure anyway. Turtle Mania was over. Oh, man. Eastman wants to move on with his life, and he sells his share of the turtles to Peter Laird and walks away from his creation. It seems he burned a lot of bridges, because in an interview a few years later, he says he doesn't even talk to anyone from that time in his life. And if this story ended there, this wouldn't be a $15 billion property. Yeah, how did it blow back up? When did it come back? I feel like it was 2012 when the Michael Bay movie happened, but maybe it was before that? Something interesting happens. A new TMNT comic book comes out, written by Peter Laird. It's black and white and published by Mirage. Okay, that's the worst one yet. It's very much the Laird version of the Turtles, which can be a bit jarring if you only know the original show. It's very sci-fi and at times very serious and soapy. <laughs> Professor X? the hell is he doing here? Quirky and personal, and you can tell Laird is having fun. And from there, things pick up steam. Laird, now the sole owner of Turtles, gets a new show on the air. And this time, he gets to do it his way. Ah, that means that no one. bebop and rocksteady, yep. no goofy gags, no mutant of the week, and a lot more violence and action and long epic story arcs. Why not bebop and rocksteady? They were cool though. I like those. And I feel like it's this era that really saved the Turtles, because Laird came back. I didn't think it was that successful in, 20, in 2007. I thought it was like... I thought these, it was like a modest success at that time. 2012 is the show, got you, okay. They weren't gonna be some 80s novelty. They were gonna impact generation after generation. It's a great era of Turtles media. The only thing missing is Kevin Eastman, but we'll get back to him. Laird claims he'll do the book as long as he's having fun. And I guess after a few years, he stops having fun because the book slows down after about 30 issues. Around this time, the animated show had run its course and Laird decides the time has finally come. He sells the rights to the Turtles to Viacom. For $18 billion. Damn, 60 million. And that's why Nickelodeon has it. Oh. 25 years after their gotcha. creation, for the first time in history, neither Eastman or Laird are in control of the Turtles' fate. 15 mil per turtle. $15 per turtle in the Capcom shop. Done. $60 for all four turtles in the game. 60 million for the rights. But that's not the end of the story either. Viacom does a deal with IDW to publish new Turtles comics in a new continuity. And who do they hire to write it? Who? Tom Waltz. No fucking who way. Who do they hire to co-write it and do who? the layouts? Kevin Eastman. Let's that's go! Right. He's back. Apparently he just needed a good 14 year break to re-energize. We get the Eastman version. And guess what? It's also really good. I'm gonna put a reading guide down below because it really is shocking how many really good Turtles comics there are. And a reading guide? It can be overwhelming. Need to check that out. Eastman even gets involved in consulting with a new TV show and the new movies. Oh, um, it's that show. And man, you gotta love all these Eastman layouts. Yet another generation gets to grow up with the turtles in their Shut! lives, still piloted by one of their co-creators. Sadly, we're still missing Peter Laird. Honestly, he seems to be happy running his blog and making ambivalent comments about the new turtle stuff, getting really into pottery. But it feels like the story <laughs> is missing an ending. $60 million to get into pottery. You buy a lot of clay for that amount of money. Good for him. I bet his kiln is spotless. I have this parasocial need for these guys to be friends with each other again. They gave me so much in my childhood, and I feel I owe them that. Well, apparently, so did somebody at Netflix. For the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle episode of the show Toys That Made Us, they decide to bring Eastman and Laird together again oh, for the first man. time. Now, that's just marketing BS because they had been together a few times at conventions, but man, I can't watch this without tearing up. Dude, that's... Huh. That's got to be such a unique feeling that none of us will ever experience. That is weird. I hope they told them both. Your lives intersected at one very particular point in your life, and you were wildly successful beyond any of your imagination, right? 
and then it turns out that you both are, you know, just kind of different. You know, you, 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 you want different things in life, so you go in different ways, and then you both kind of do different things, whatever. And then you meet again, like, 30 years later? That's crazy, dude. We had that window installed. Yeah. Because our big idea was we each have a drawing table next to the window. I'd be in the other room. You'd oh, be here. Oh, man. Yeah. And we'd literally pass pages through the window. They're, like, reminiscing now, too, bro. Never happened. No. That moment, that pause when they both look at what could have been, the life unlived, where they had a lot less money, a lot less fame, but got to spend their lives drawing comics with their friend, passing the pages back and forth. But that's not the end of this story either, because shortly after that meeting, a new Turtles book comes out. And look who it's credited to, oh. Kevin Eastman and Peter Laird. It seems that sometime after that meeting, Eastman dug through some old boxes and found an outline for a Turtles graphic novel that he and Laird had drafted during the golden years of their collaboration. That's the one that I do want to read that I thought might be interesting, but I feel like I would have to read the other ones to get it. You know what I mean? ...in the late 80s, but never got to make into a reality because their success distracted them. It's probably the closest thing we'll get to a new Eastman and Laird collaboration. Interestingly, it ignores all the continuity from the image run, Laird's run, oh. Eastman's run, erasing all those years of strife and discord and serves as a direct continuation of and conclusion to their original collaboration. Oh, fuck! I need to read that then. This is where I start. I just read the original and then go into that. That's and sick. of course, the magic was back. Because that's only 16 issues. That's not crazy. It follows the last surviving turtle in his final struggle against the Foot Clan, lonely and haunted by guilt and remorse and the memory of his lost friends. <laughs> they should never take those headbands off. They should never do that. They should wear them at all times. I don't like, I don't like those. As he lays their weapons down to rest one oh final time, he says, I miss my brothers so much. Oh man. Also, I had a huge crush on Rouge. Is that her name? Not Rouge the Bat. No, not the fucking, we're talking about X-Men. 